Old habits die hard and old politics even worse. Just look at the World Health Organization. Their report card has been dismal. Failed to inform us about the pandemic. Failed to advise us about how to deal with it. And then gave a clean chit to China. In my book, that is a fail. But instead of learning from its mistakes, the WHO is back to doing what it does best. Pandering to China. How? By refusing entry to Taiwan. The annual World Health Assembly meeting is underway. Dozens of member states and observers are attending. Taiwan also asked for an invite. But once again, the WHO chief refused. Our old friend, Dr. Tedros. He's gotten re-elected as the Director General of the World Health Organization. But instead of shaking things up, he's sticking to the status quo. Hence, no Taiwan. China is celebrating the decision. Their own voice says it's a validation of the one China policy. Listen to this. The WHA has rejected Taiwan-related proposals for seven consecutive years, which fully evidences that the One China principle has won universal support from the international community and represents the trend of the world and is in line with people's aspiration. It also shows once again that hyping up Taiwan-related issues at the WHO assembly will get nowhere and is unpopular. Some background here. Taiwan used to attend meetings of the World Health Assembly, but that changed in 2017. Elections the year before, in 2016, brought President Tsai Ing-wen to office in Taiwan. She's fiercely anti-China. So starting 2017, Beijing began blocking Taiwan. What does that say? This is vindictive politics by China. It's their way of punishing Taiwanese nationals. But what's the solution? Taiwan is an island of 23 million people. It's one of the most advanced economies in Asia. Surely their contributions will be vital. Just look at the Wuhan virus outbreak. Taiwan's initial response was the gold standard. They had reported just 10 deaths by May 2021. The Omicron wave did hurt them, but that first response was unparalleled. Plus, Taiwan had close access to Chinese patients. Their patient zero was a teacher from Wuhan. This gave Taiwan more insight into the virus than any other country. But the WHO did not care. Throughout the pandemic, they blocked Taiwan. They caved into Chinese pressure. Could the WHO have done something different? Well, Western countries do think so. They've been asking Dr. Tedros to personally invite Taiwan. Forget the member states. Just send an invitation yourself. But Tedros has repeatedly refused. He says he doesn't have the power, that all decisions must be taken by the member states. Well then, the member states also wanted action against China. They also wanted to investigate the origins of the Wuhan virus. Why wasn't Dr. Tedros excited about that? His politics is risking global health. It is denying a basic human right to 23 million Taiwanese. And for what? To stay on China's good books? That was the argument during the pandemic, that China's support was necessary to fight the pandemic, to gather details about the virus. And how is that going, we ask? Three years later, China is still blocking an independent investigation. It's not like they've thrown open the labs. So the WHO's argument doesn't work anymore. One China or two China or no China, Beijing will not share details about the virus. So might as well do the right thing. As for the WHO's organizational compulsions, it's a laughable argument, really. Do you remember this picture? It shows envoys of a fictional country at a United Nations conference. You may have heard about it. Kailasa is a fake country run by fugitive godman Nityanand. Even they managed to attend a United Nations event. But Taiwan can't. Just how absurd is that? A fictional country versus a democracy of 23 million people. There is a point where human good should override politics, and the pandemic was one such point. More than 6.8 million people have died from the Wuhan virus. Taiwan is one of the few countries that escaped almost unscathed. So having them on board is not a value addition. It's an absolute necessity. If not, we're setting the stage for another pandemic. Dr. Tedros keeps asking the world to prepare better. Maybe he should start with himself. Invite Taiwan and make our planet safer and healthier. Meanwhile, India is working to burnish its credentials as a pharmacy of the world. The pandemic established that. 
India sent life-saving vaccines and medicines to the whole world. But last year, there was an unfortunate turn of events. Cough syrups exported from India were linked to the deaths of children. Almost 100 children in Gambia and Uzbekistan died. India's reputation took a hit. The government swung into action. It came up with a more comprehensive regulatory mechanism. And the new rules will come into effect soon. All cough syrups meant for export will have to be tested. And this testing will take place in government labs in India. This will serve two purposes. Regulate pharma companies and allay the fears of importing countries. Not to mention, protect India's reputation as a pharmaceutical hub. Our next report has more. India's rise as a global pharmaceutical powerhouse is well known. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it stepped up to help the world with vaccines. India's pharmaceutical sector is renowned for effective medicines at competitive prices. But that reputation has recently taken a hit. It was caused by reports of deaths linked to cough syrups exported from India. Children were the victims of these faulty cough syrups. So the Indian government rushed to take action. And now it has come out with a new set of rules. From June 1st, all cough syrup exports will need to be tested. That too at government labs. Seven of these labs have been marked for testing. A cough syrup sample will have to be sent to them for checks. Once they clear the tests, they will get a certificate of analysis. Only then can these cough syrups be exported. It's a thorough process to ensure there's no compromise on quality because lives are at stake. Last October, news of faulty cough syrups emerged from the Gambia. It's a West African country of about 2.7 million people. Reports said that some cough syrups had led to the death of about 70 children. The WHO issued an alert. WHO has today issued a medical product alert for four contaminated medicines identified in the Gambia that have been potentially linked with acute kidney injuries and 66 deaths among children. The WHO began an investigation. It turned out all of the cough syrups had a common link. Four medicines are cough and cold syrups produced by Maiden Pharmaceuticals Limited in India. WHO is conducting further investigation with the company and regulatory authorities in India. The investigations failed to establish a clear link between the deaths and the Indian cough syrups. But then came reports from Uzbekistan. In December, 18 Uzbek children died after taking an Indian cough syrup. It was made by Marion Biotech. It's a pharmaceutical company based in the city of Noida in northern India. In both the Gambia and Uzbekistan, the children had died due to kidney failure. The Uzbek investigation revealed that the cause was toxins in the cough syrup. The toxins are diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. The same toxins were found in Indian cough syrup exports this year as well. This time in the Pacific Island nations of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. India had to act fast. You see, India has a $41 billion pharmaceutical industry. It's the world's largest supplier of genetic medicines. About a third of all genetic drugs are from India. These go across the world, from the Gambia to the US, from the Maldives to Micronesia. Indian drugs are everywhere. So India has to ensure the very best quality. The Indian government stepped up. In March, the Drugs Controller General of India raided about 76 pharmaceutical companies. 18 pharma licenses were cancelled after the raids. And now comes this mandatory testing requirement. It's a welcome step. Hopefully, it can help save lives. For the last story tonight, let's talk about parenting. They say having children is like living in a frat house. No one sleeps, everything is broken, and there's a lot of throwing up. But jokes aside, the struggle is real. Because while parenthood is rewarding, it can also be exhausting. Raising a child is hard. Many say the hardest job in the world. According to a recent survey, two-thirds of parents say it's harder than they'd expected. And this is not in their heads. Research says parenting is more demanding than it used to be. Today, parents spend more time and money on their children than previous generations. They feel more pressure to be hands-on. And this can feel like a juggling contest, a balancing act between taking care of children and managing your own well-being. And guess which of the two takes a hit? 
It's usually the parents' energy and well-being. And the result is this, parental burnout. No, this is not a buzzword or a Western concept or an excuse to do less. Parental burnout is real. It affects tens of millions of parents across the world. In fact, it's probably existed for centuries. Only the term is new. Think about it. The term parenting itself is relatively new. Fun fact, rather a sad fact, parenting wasn't recognized as a word in the dictionary until the 1950s. It only became widely used in the 1970s, but because of the shift, child rearing came to be seen as a task, a concept that pushes people to do more, to be more successful as parents. And this leads to pressure and then to burnout in some cases. So what is parental burnout? A lot like workplace burnout, except here parents face physical, emotional and mental exhaustion. And this is thanks to the seemingly endless demands of caring for one's children. It's a syndrome that results from chronic par parenting stress. It involves fatigue, irritability, body aches and changes in sleeping patterns or appetite. If you show these signs, ask yourself these questions. Do you experience constant exhaustion, physical or emotional? Do you feel like you aren't doing enough? Do you feel overwhelmed with the role of being a parent and do you feel emotionally disconnected? If you do, you may be suffering from parental burnout and there is no shame in it. There are many out there like you. Parental burnout is a global phenomenon experienced across communities and cultures. It's highest in countries like Poland, Belgium and the US. About 8% of all parents in these countries are burnt out. But like I said, the research is new and these studies don't really cover some Asian countries like India and many African countries. But they do say that parental burnout is vast. Research shows that 60% parents do not routinely relax. 50% say they don't have enough time to do the things they want. And 40% say their tiredness stops them from being the parent they want to be. So what should they do? Experts say take a break. Make time for yourself. It will improve your mental and physical health. It will also help your children and your family. Start by telling yourself it's okay to take a breath, to be kind to yourself, to prioritize yourself. Parenthood can be the most special and rewarding of experiences. Children are like the gifts that keep on giving. But to make the most of it, parents need to set priorities and seek help if they're burnt out. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with India. The Natu Natu fever has reached the G20 summit, the meeting happening in Kashmir. Actor Ram Charan made delegates dance to the song. In England, water buffaloes took a dip in a new private swimming pool in Essex. The owners of the pool have sought compensation. They say the animals have ruined their pool worth over $80,000. And in Guatemala, some cliff divers took their skill and love for adventure to a new height. And finally, what makes this day, the 23rd of May, significant? We are taking you back in history on this day in 1915. Italy declared war on Austria and Hungary. And with that, Rome entered the world war on the side of the original allies, Britain, France, Russia. Initially, when the war broke out in 1914, Italy chose to be neutral in the conflict. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching.
email exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colony. US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the Colonial Loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.